And again, my name is Beth Sheffield. I'm the Adult Programming Coordinator at the Greensboro Public Library. Welcome to this special presentation in honor of National Book Lovers Month of Love and War. Uh, we have four authors who've written um, extensively on honor and glory, but also all of their work, there's this interweaving of what is love and how does it um, impact people in the military. So uh, we're very excited. I'll introduce um, Matt Armstrong first. Um, he is the author of Mysteries of Haditha, recently published and nominated for the um, American Best Book Award by Potomac Books. He was embedded in the JSOF in the Anbar province, Iraq. Um, and he's also uh, published uh, uh, with Missouri Review, Gettysburg Review, Monkey, Psych Monkey Bicycle Epiphany, and the Literary Review, and many other journalists. Uh, he is a member of the Van Diva La Morte, and uh, you can find him on Twitter at MC Army Strong. So, our, uh, Matt, I will take it away, let you take it away. Okay, thank you, Beth. Thank you so much for having us tonight. Thank you, everybody out there uh, in the chat room. Thank you, Colin Halloran. Thank you, Teresa Fazio. And thank you, Mary Doyle, for joining us. I thought a, uh, you know, far be it for me to be the MC of an event, but I thought a good way. Eh, eh. I like uh, it. Thank you. Thank you. I go by the author name. Strong. Far be it for me to be an MC. But um, I thought we would start tonight with a little bit of poetry. And I thought a good way to begin the night would be to hand it over to our resident poet, Colin Halloran, the recent author of American Etiquette, to say a few words about love, to start us with a poem, and also invite everybody into the conversation through both that conceptual framework and um, this first poem. So Colin? Without further ado, I all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna kick us off with uh, actually an unpublished piece. This is from uh, something that I'm working on now. The muzzle velocity of a five five six round fired from an M4 carbine is two thousand nine hundred seventy feet per second. A forty millimeter grenade fired from a mounted Mark 19 leaves the muzzle at a rate of 240.69 meters per second. The Mark 19 can unleash 40 rounds per minute at a sustained rate of fire, 60 at a rapid rate of fire. With a maximum effective range of 1600 meters, it can take more than six seconds between launch and impact. A time and distance long enough that from the firing point, you see the flash seconds before you hear the impact. It takes me far less time to fall in love. That's a good one to start with. Perfect. Thanks, because as as Beth said, uh, you know, and I think it was Darude before her. What is what is love? Um, <laughs> you know that that piece doesn't refer to um, some of the other types of love that, that we're going to be hearing about tonight. Um, you know, one of the, the shortcomings of the English language is, is so brilliantly demonstrated by a word like love, where, you know, we say we love pizza, we love our mother, we love our spouses, we, and like, I, I love my dogs, right? I love the cow painting behind me. Uh, but I don't feel the same way about pizza as I do about my mother. And I definitely don't feel the same way about my mother as I, I do about my dogs. Um, we don't need to get into the hierarchy there. But this is where, you know, uh, I turn to, <laughs> I turn to uh, the Greek language. Um, and, and in Greek, uh, there's eight different types of love. Um, there's philia, which is uh, affectionate love, uh, love without romantic attraction. Uh, philia, the, the word that is the root uh, for Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. That's why, that's why it's called that, because philia is that brotherly love 
that love that we're going to hear about um, that exists between comrades in arms. Uh, you have pragma, uh, enduring love. You have storga, which is the familiar love, like the love between family. Um, you have ludus, which is uh, a more playful, flirtatious love. Um, you have eros, obviously, romantic love. Um, mania, which is that obsessive love, which, you know, is certainly something that, that comes up a little bit, um, in some of my more recent work where, you know, with, uh, the nature of, uh, post-traumatic stress, uh, that, that obsessive compulsive can come in, addiction can come in. Um, and so that's kind of that, that mania, which means obsessive love. Um, and then, of course, you have uh, agape, which is sort of like a selfless, universal love. And so one of the things that I've said, you know, many times before is that, you know, war is essentially life distilled, right? You find the entire experience of life um, from birth to death in war. And so if all of these types of love exist within life, then it makes sense then that all of them also exist in war. Um, and so I think from everyone tonight, we're going to hear um, this kind of intersection and sometimes almost a crashing against um, a battle between these different types of love uh, that exist, you know, in our lives and, and in a more distilled, uh, often more intense and, and flash point way uh, in war. Colin, thank you. Thank, that, thank you for starting us off with such a great poem and uh, with a really complex and seemingly timeless uh, architecture for discussing love and war. But one of the questions I'd like to invite the rest of the panel into before we hear our next reading is this. We start with this conversation that is rooted in the ancient Greeks with these concepts that go back thousands of years. But is there anything new under the sun when it comes to love? When it comes to the love stories that we start to see populating the forever war or what some call the global war on terror, is there anything new under the sun? Do we see any new features in the war stories of our generation? And I'd like to uh, throw this question to Teresa. Yeah. Um... So I think it's not necessarily new, but it has been more talked about over the past decade or so, as we see more of the stories of women coming to the fore. Um, you know, it's no secret that the military is disproportionately male. And when you have women serving in combat zones and mm -hmm. folks are heterosexual, or when you have uh, openly gay service members serving, and you know, folks can get attracted to each other when they're in war. So I think we're seeing people talk about more of those stories. It's not that those stories weren't happening before because they most certainly were, like even certainly all the way back to the ancient Greeks. Um, but I think more of those stories of people being attracted to each other and acting on that and actually admitting it are coming out now, at least in part. Um, and I think Mary also uh, you know, has written and, and talked about that too. Yeah, in my, <laughs> in my day, it was all very much a big secret, you know. Um, the motor pool was a place where people went to engage in, you know, romantic um, outings. And um, I once heard that there was a port john that <laughs> people liked to frequent. Um, I have to admit that I was completely naive. I mean, I, I, when I deployed, and this is to Bosnia 20 years ago or more, um, I, uh, the, the defense that I had was to just sort of turn off any kind of sexual um, thoughts or feelings. And um, I mean, I, I found people attractive, but I just shut it down. And um, the difficulty is when you, when you shut things down, it's kind of difficult to turn them back on again. Um, but so my experience with actual love on the battlefield is just rumor. I mean, I never actually saw it and I never actually 
participated in it. Um, and it was always very taboo. You know, it was just that, you know, it didn't matter if you were straight or gay or single or married. It was just not, not a good thing. <laughs> very much bad. Mary, with the, with the taboo in mind, with the forbidden in mind, uh, would you mind if I asked you a follow-up question? Okay, so um, many people probably don't know that Mary Doyle has worn uh, many hats in her career as a writer. For instance, Mary was the ghostwriter slash co-author. What do you prefer, ghostwriter or co-author for uh, Shoshana's book? Um, ghostwriter. I usually say ghostwriter. Yeah, she was the ghostwriter for I'm Still Standing, From Captive U.S. Soldier to Free Citizen, My Journey Home. This memoir tells the story of Shoshana Nyree Johnson, the first black female prisoner of war in American military history. Mary, in light of all the projects you've undertaken, what do you see as the unique appeal, not of memoir, but of the genre that you are pursuing so much of lately, which is handling uh, forbidden topics regularly, which is to say erotic romance. For those of you who don't know, Mary also is an erotic romance novelist and therefore perfect for tonight's event. What do, what do you find to be the, the appeal for you as a writer of working within that genre? Well, the, I mean, the taboo is obviously um, the funnest thing to explore in, um, in erotica. I have a book of, um, it's called Limited Partnerships. It's about, uh, the, it's four novellas. Um, it's basically a, a male escort service. And um, each, each one of the novellas is a man in, in these, um, you know, providing this service to wealthy women. And it takes on different, you know, sometimes it's a straight up um, paid, sexual uh, arrangement other times as sex is it gets far more complicated and um i think that um i don't know it's, it's just fun to um kind of explore things that most people would never become involved in but then the, you know that's part of the thing that makes you want to kind of fantasize about it a little bit um, I have a short story in a um, in a collection called the um, what is it the library's dirty uh, sexy librarians dirty thirty <laughs> it's like an anthology of thirty short stories and this particular one is about um, three people who run off during a training exercise in the middle of a of a big big field exercise and um, you know have have some diversions <laughs> and just the idea of uh, three people, um, two men and a woman in full battle rattle, you know, finding a, um, an empty mount site location and just, you know, having fun um, was just, I thought that that would just be a fun location and a fun place to, um, kind of let it all hang out, I guess. Are you in the mood yeah. to let it uh, all hang out a little bit tonight? Can we have a little taste of that point of intersection between erotic romance and military writing? Yeah, so the um, what I'm reading tonight is not erotica. Um, okay. I have this, um, this three book mystery series and um, it's, it's more of the, the normal kind of military uh, relationship, I think, where, um, you know, women end up on, in these heavily male situations. And um, no matter how you look at it, most of the men in uniform, by the time they're senior NCOs or officers, they're married. And um, so it, 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 um, it's almost inevitable that a woman is going to um, be approached by someone who is married. This particular book is the first book in the mystery series. It's called The Peacekeeper's Photograph. It takes place in Bosnia. Um, the 
uh, lead character, Master Sergeant Lauren Harper, has been working with her commanding officer for many, many years. And um, she comes home from a mission outside the wire and finds her soldier and her uh, roommate murdered. And so she, like any NCO, she calls her commanding officer. He comes down to um, try to help her work through this whole situation. And um, this is what happens. She takes him to his VIP trailer as he as a, is arriving to the camp. And one of the first things they do is look at the fact that he has a private bathroom. And she's looking at herself in the mirror. You look like crap, I whispered to my reflection. I smiled at the luxury of having a mirror, then remembered the, the image of the two of us standing together. You shouldn't be here. I said, staring at my reflection, are you talking to yourself in there? Just admiring the accommodations, I said, stepping out of the small room. McCallan shrugged out of his shoulder holster and dropped his flak vest on the floor. I leaned my M16 against the wall and took off my flak vest. Our eyes met again. My stomach did a nervous flip. I couldn't look at him. I paced around the room, pretending to check out everything, for years, especially in most recent months, I had made it my business to avoid being alone with him. Del Rey had been a useful, unsuspecting tool in that mission. Now she was gone. I'm sorry about all of this, Harper. You finding her like that, he said. How are you doing? To anyone else, I would have said I was okay. I couldn't lie to McAllen. Frankly, sir, I'm kind of a mess. You don't look a mess. You look great, actually. It's good to see you. I could feel the heat in my face. I smiled back at him. I could blame you for all of this, you know, sir. If you had given me that transfer I requested, I wouldn't be here. He chuckled. I couldn't let you go, Harper. I needed you with me. On this deployment, I mean. I started to feel warm. I went to the air conditioner and cranked it up a couple notches. Then I went to a window, parted the blinds, and looked out, anything to keep from looking at him, at his gray eyes. I brought up the subject, the subject I usually used when the tension grew too much. How's Michelle and the boys? He leaned back onto the desk and crossed his arms, his wedding ring glinting in the soft light from a nearby window. They're fine. When is she due, I asked, even though I knew the answer. He looked down, a crimson blush working its way up his neck, around three months. I opened drawers in the nightstand, fiddled with the lamp, cycling through the three different light levels. A wooden locker in a far corner had so far been ignored. I went to it, opened it, closed it. After that, I searched for something else to occupy my attention. I glanced at McAllen. He clenched his jaw but the desire in his eyes burned me from across the room. Oh God, I sighed, frozen in place. This is not good. Lauren, he said, standing, let me be here for you. You are here, sir, I said weakly. I appreciate you coming. That sounded so lame. I opened my mouth to say more, but didn't know where to begin. I couldn't tell him that I needed his strength or that I felt totally and completely alone. I couldn't say that I already carried a heavy bucket of guilt about, about Del Rey. I didn't need another one to balance me out. Instead, he told me what he couldn't do. I couldn't stay away, he said. Please don't talk like that. He took a step toward me and hesitated. Even after all the years we'd worked together, our physical contact had been restricted to handshakes for congratulations and pats on the shoulder and encouragement. The prospect of touching him in any way was enough to make my mouth dry. He started to speak and then stopped, his hands curled into fists. I could hardly breathe. I looked at the door, knowing I should leave. When the tension built like this in the past, leaving had always been the best option. For years, leaving had been, work, had been enough. Dim light slanted in through the blinds on the windows, and he stood in the wash of the light. Subdued tapping on the roof meant the rain had started again. Damn it, Lauren, he said, shaking his head. I know you're about to walk out. Don't, just don't. 
He opened his arms and gestured with his hands for me to come. No one could fault me for giving you a hug under these circumstances. You need a hug. Hell, I need a hug. He made it sound so innocent. I couldn't go to him, and yet nothing could stop me. I took another long look at the door. Then I moved toward him. It was just a hug, but with each step, I knew nothing good would come of it. I always like to think I'm in control. I was in control, complete control, when I stepped into his embrace. I always like to think I'm in control. <laughs> Don't we always? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes when it comes to the heart, you just really aren't. Yeah, if it's involved, chances are we're not yep. in control. That, um, that seems a pretty good segue, considering its context of uh, fidelity, to uh, Teresa Fazio, the author of a book that goes by the name of Fidelis. Um, I have a number of questions that I'd like to ask both of you to connect it to, but I think it's a, it's a good time right now to just jump right in to Fidelis, which is a really wonderful memoir that was published by the same house, Potomac Books, uh, that published my book, The Mysteries of Aditha. I'm very uh, happy to be here with you tonight, Teresa, my sister in yeah. uh, memoir publications and publishing like, brother here. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's great to see you. And uh, I think this is just a, a perfect time to bring Fidelis into the uh, conversation. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so piggybacking on what Mary had said, you know, I think uh, both of our books deal a lot with what troops owe each other and what troops feel for each other, both in country and upon returning home. And sometimes when you deploy, you know, you press pause on your life back home and then you go off and have the most intense experience that you've ever had in your entire life in many cases, uh, especially for folks who are so young. And, you know, we deploy when we're 18 to maybe 25. Maybe the older staff NCOs are all of like 30. Maybe I had a gun. He was 35. Oh, my gosh. So it was, you know, and I'm older than that now, sadly. So, um, you know, you have these young people experiencing incredibly intense things. Uh you know, facing fire, facing the enemy, facing dead comrades, and needing both an outlet for all that energy and then solace in a place that is threatening your life daily. And so these bonds that people form are very, very intense, 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 intense. Um, under the constant stresses of, you know, even behind the wire too, when you're, when you're on a base. And then, you may get done with that, that deployment and you roll the dice and you don't die and that's great. Um, but then you come home and it's like pressing play on your life again. And uh, the world back in the States really hasn't changed much at all, but you internally have changed. And in some cases have fallen in love either with a person or with an adrenaline fueled lifestyle or you know can't turn off memories or things racing in your head. And people deal with those things in very different ways and relationships that might be incredibly intense or seem like a good idea or even logical, uh, you know, looking at the, the story Mary just told in country may take on a very different tenor when you come back home. And um, Fidelis winds up exploring, you know, what do we owe each other as comrades in arms, as potential lovers, um, as people, both in war and after coming home from it. So, yeah. Any chance we could get a, uh, a little reading from Fidelis? <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, so the section I'll read has to do a bit with that. And uh, I apologize, it might be a minute or two longer than, than Mary's. Um, so I hope that's all right with the audience here. I guess you can just shout at me if it's not. And feel um, free to so start you need to shouting know. your questions, folks. I'm sorry for the interruption. I just wanted to say feel free, folks, oh, no. in the chat room to start putting in yeah. anyone in the conversation. If anything comes up in any of these readings that you'd like to talk about, we will be fielding questions. So just pepper us in the chat room. Yeah, feel free. Um, so this is what cover of Fidelis looks like. It's also behind me. And uh, all you need to know about uh, these two characters here is it's you know in the voice of yours truly. Um, and Jack, the other character in here is uh, 
these uh, these two have not seen each other. Thanks, Matt, um, for about five years in these scenes. On the eve of my birthday, I stood in the kitchen baking cookies. My cell phone rang. I ungloved my hand from the burnt mitt, flipped open my phone. It was Jack. Hey, he said, I'm outside. No, you're not, I said, except I'd heard an echo through the open window. I'm here a day early, thought I'd surprise you, help you celebrate your birthday, he said. I left the cookie sheet on the counter, smoothed my hair, ran downstairs, sock slid on the tiled lobby floor, flung open the door, and jumped into his arms. I knocked off his silly pork pie hat, and he dropped a wooden cane. A green t-shirt swayed on his six-foot-two frame. He'd been driving for six hours. When I'd mentioned the party and rattled off my address a few weeks before, I hadn't believed he would come. Upstairs, he put down his backpack in my living room. He was balder, thicker than I remembered. We sat on my sagging love seat. It dipped us shoulder to shoulder. I shifted slightly to face him. A chocolate chip stained my favorite shirt. I didn't care. Resting his cane along the couch, he explained he couldn't walk more than a few blocks unassisted. He'd fallen off a seven-ton back in Iraq. I didn't remember the accident. Maybe it had happened after I'd left when their convoy had been hit by an IED. That I remembered. Jack had had vertebra surgery and was in the process of being granted a medical retirement. Still, he seemed largely the same. When he smiled, his dimples puckered into the shape I remembered so well. I told him about school, about my nanotech research, about how good it was to see him. We reminisced about his old Marines. Sanchez was in college, majoring in sociology. Judging from his Facebook posts, he hadn't lost his sense of humor. I know I'm signed up for classes, but totally forgot what I signed up for, he wrote. I think that's how I joined the Marine Corps. Haas, on the other hand, had taken a job digging graves at a VA cemetery in Colorado, which exacerbated his PTSD. I have to keep him from killing himself every couple of weeks, Jack said. I'd nearly forgotten about his ethos of care. He took personal credit for keeping his former troops alive, not seeming to realize that not all of their lives depended directly upon him now. We spoke of the injured Iraqi pigeon he'd adopted, an escapade neither of us had talked about in five years. Gray and white Fred had hopped one-legged on Jack's fake linoleum floor, wearing a homemade splint. By way of a nest, Jack had assembled a fluff of shredded paper towels and an old t-shirt atop his plywood bookshelf. After a couple weeks recuperation, Jack had set a healed Fred free. In those days, he'd cared for me too, offering solace when I needed it, but couldn't ask. Now, half a decade later, I'd grown used to caring for myself. Around 2 a.m., we grew too tired to talk anymore. I let Jack hug me goodnight in my bedroom. Suddenly, I stood back in his shadowed bunker, nosing the space where I knew a jujitsu tattoo still marked his chest. I knew how the hair on his belly would crackle against his shirt and how his left ribs thickened into a bony knot I'd needed five years before. In Iraq, his love handles had shrunk day by day as he'd stopped eating meat or anything resembling human flesh. Now his heft had returned and he stood unsteadily. I couldn't resist tickling those ribs just a little. He stumbled forward and we wrestled. He planted his heel behind mine, martial arts style, and swept me to the floor, covering me like a turtle shell. I remembered resting on his poncho liner, cradled in the crook of his elbow after we'd grappled too long on his floor. In Iraq, secrecy had been paramount. If we'd been caught together, we would have faced disciplinary action. Here and now, we could do what we wanted, and yet I promised myself I wouldn't share a bed with him. That could go nowhere good, at least not unless I got some answers. I turned my head away. I'm not going back to TQ, I whispered. He let me wriggle out from his hold. We stood, and he put a meaty paw on my loft bed frame. His eyes flicked upward. It swayed slightly. A death trap suitable only for holding my 120 pounds. No way, I said, grateful for my loft's flawed bolts. We have an air mattress somewhere. Do you want me to sleep in the living room instead, he asked. I thought of his six-foot-two frame on our rickety love seat, a spinal disaster. No, it's okay, you can stay in my room, but definitely on the air mattress, I said. The velvet-topped plastic groaned as we inflated it. Then he opened a zip-up pill case, Depakote for tremors, painkillers, sleep aids that made Ambien look like Skittles. Each bottle had its own pouch. Good night, beautiful, he slurred, slipping into unconsciousness. Good night, Jack, I replied, marveling that this man, after five long years, was finally staying the night. I think I'll stop there. Thank you.
Can I ask you and Mary a question before we move back to Colin for a second? Because obviously your readings have this in common. They're both focused on infidelity and infidelity in a military context. In what ways does the, the issue of infidelity get complicated when we witness it from the woman's point of view in the military? I mean, I can start a bit with uh, like the thing I always say, uh, which is there's so many ways to be a woman full stop. There's so many ways to be a woman in the military full stop. And the end of one experience of one person is not the experience of everybody. So at officer candidate school, I don't know if Mary got a similar speech, but like we got told if you're a woman in the Marine Corps, you're a bitch, a dyke or a hoe. And those were like the three extremely limited options that literally our instructors were outlining for us. And there's so many broader ways to be in the world. So the fact that this does happen sometimes does not mean it happens like every single time. And at the same time, it's something that like until kind of now-ish, nobody has ever talked about or been open about. And really until like the entire gender spectrum was acknowledged and allowed to openly serve in the military, like so many different experiences were just swept under the rug. So my goal in speaking out about this sort of thing is to make it uh, maybe a little bit easier for those who come after us, where if you're about to be mired in a similar situation, maybe you'll think twice, or if you are mired in a similar situation, like folks don't feel quite so alone. And if it helps other people feel not quite so alone, then it's done its job. Um, so yeah, I don't know if, if Mary, you have points to add to that before we like actually answer Beth's question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I wanted to say something about your book and that I loved how you not only talked about yourself and how you were maneuvering through um, being a woman in, in a deployed situation, but how the women around you were. And it wasn't like in a gossipy way. It was just like, these are, these are the kinds of choices that other women have made and they're okay. You know, I think there, there are points in, in your book where you're, you're, you're wondering whether other people have made better choices than what you have made and then I think that in the end this is just my interpretation um, it feels as if you're just saying that you know any of those ways was okay and um, you know it's just what however way it is um, that you can maneuver sometimes you you have more choices than others um, and the, the only other thing I would add is that um, and, and it's kind of something that you address in your book too, Teresa, where um, the, the decision to be, um, you know, to have a deployed affair is not a new thing for, for men who go on deployment, men who go on TDY, you know, women who do the same thing, you know, th this is, you know, what goes on TDY stays on TDY, you know, the sort of attitude that um, when you leave, when you go into a different zip code, suddenly, you know, all bets are off. And um, in a deployed situation that, um, that can feel even more intense in that, you know, you feel like, or so, some people feel as if no one will ever know, you know, the spouse will never know. Um, but they know, I mean, they, there, there is just no way that they don't know what is going on. And it's almost as if you're, you're expecting this spouse to be some sort of superhuman and, um, to sort of accept this thing that goes on and it, um, yeah, I, I, and I don't like being on the other end of that, you know, or you're being pulled into this, this thing. Um, and, you know, kind of participating in this, this thing. <laughs> the other thing I would say is about um, gendered power and, and the structure that until extremely recently, where like, the military is still wrestling with this now, but the structure of gendered power in the military is like incredibly masculine. Like, yes, men are, you know, afforded all of the sexual agency in the world you know, they're expected to like try to get laid. They're expected to go to the strip clubs, you know, like all of that. Whereas 
on the flip side, like the women are, are not largely in Western culture, like feminine power is is more of a, a, a receptive or an attractive thing, like trying to get people to do things for you because you're cute. And like, that totally doesn't work in the military. It just makes people think you're weak. And so I, I write a little bit in the book about how other women who were more traditionally feminine would get all this male attention, but they would not be perceived as competent as their job at their jobs. And so, you know, the way I tried to deal with that was by at least outwardly acting like everybody's kid sister or big sister, you know, depending on our relative ranks or positions or whatever, and being pretty androgynous, to, like I used to look like Harry Potter. So, you know, the the flip side of that being, I was not, you know, allowing myself to have any sort of romantic attention overtly, because that would be appearing overtly vulnerable. And like in a war zone, that's the worst thing to be. You know, it otherwise though makes those secret feelings like so much more intense because literally people are literally dying. You know, outside the wire, they're being brought inside the wire to the surgical shock trauma platoon, the mortuary affairs platoon, like you're surrounded by that. So there's this heightened, you know, intensity of whatever feelings you have, whether it's rage or homesickness or loneliness or anger or lust or love or, or all of those things. It's just made much more colorful. So, yeah. Hi, it's Beth here, and I um, am going to, there's a couple questions in the chat I was going to get to uh, for everyone, but I also wanted to encourage Matt to read from his book as well, um, and good, his yeah. experience I, with love, so yeah. You want to um, you you start with the question, then I can uh, read, and then we can uh, come back to Colin? Yeah, that sounds great. So um, uh, one, Teresa, you know, your relationship, you know, keeping it a secret and you, you do talk about that, um, you know, that balance over the years. And then suddenly the book, book is released and it's, it's not a secret anymore um, with the world. And, you know, how did you make that brave leap? Um, short answer, it's terrifying. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Uh, there came a point where not telling the story became more painful than telling the story. Um, had a, one of my first writing instructors in New York, uh, her name's Sue Shapiro, she's great. I think she's got a book out too recently called The Forgive Forgiveness Tour. And uh, she had this line like, you're only as sick as your secrets. And so, you know, if, if I was able to tell my own story, then um, I get to own it and I get to write the ending. So, um, you know, there's, there's that. Uh, I'm still living it, you know, how's that working out for me? I don't know, I'll let you know later, I guess. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a weird thing to have that out in the world. Um, you just kind of gotta own it and go with it and, and see what happens. Well, I can, uh, I can give an amen to not telling the story is often more painful than telling the story. Um, so with the mysteries of Adith of the memoir, I've also published through Potomac Books, there is a very pronounced tension between love and war. Um, I'm a rookie journalist in this story set in the year 2008. And the book goes back and forth between Iraq, where I did embed with Joint Special Operations Forces and America. And long story short, What's happening in America is I'm struggling to get embedded with a newspaper called the Winchester Star, but I'm also struggling to get over a very powerful relationship. I was engaged to be married to a woman named Karen, a name that has come into infamy this year. She was a good Karen. Uh, I loved her tremendously. And um, I was struggling to get over that relationship. So in many ways, as I found myself getting close to embedding in Iraq, I found myself really torn between these poles of going back to love, a love, going back into a relationship versus going forward with my intuition that I needed to see beyond the TV, and on the computer, my, my country's war what we were doing in Iraq. So what I'm gonna read right now sort of finds us in the middle of that struggle, still trying to decide whether I wanna to return to Karen, still struggling to get to Iraq. 
Shortly after I got the word from Tom Bird about the Winchester Star sponsoring my trip to Iraq, I received a phone call from Diet alerting me to the fact that my father had been calling his father in an attempt to convince him, Diet's father, to convince Diet to convince me to not go to Iraq. I was furious when I heard about it, embarrassed to be chastised by my old boyhood friend like I was some kind of fool. Brief interruption. This boyhood friend is the leader of the SEAL platoon that I'll later in bed with. And my nickname to Diet from high school was Eat Boy. Eat Boy Diet said, you're a man. This is your decision. If you come over here, you're gonna be with the platoon of Navy SEALs. Your dad thinks you're gonna get your head chopped off and he wants me to tell you that shit like that happens. And yeah, shit like that happens. But look who it happens to. That does not happen to SEALs. I did not like being talked to like that. Just as I had an inferiority complex when it came to my brother, I also had one when it came to diet. Diet and my brother lived in the land of the body. They slaughtered and saved real human bodies. I, meanwhile, played with and pursued the paths of the mind and did not yet have a yogi in my mind to remind me that the mind was part of the body. No, I did not like learning of my father's meddling from the man and my group of friends who had always acted like my father. Now here he was sharing the story of my father's meddling and reminding me in a new way of everything I was not. Furious, I hung up the phone, paced around in the brown darkness of that Colfax kitchen, the tall black trees in the backyard towering over the house and shedding their leaves in the wind. I stepped outside onto the deck to look up at the stars and clear my head. The will to go to Iraq deepened against my father's opposition, his willingness to meddle, not to mention Diet's challenge. Eat boy, you're a man. Several days later, I nearly exploded after receiving a call from Tom Bird, editor of the newspaper. I'm sorry, Matt, he said, but we're not going to be able to sponsor a trip to Iraq. What, I said? What the hell had happened? I stood up from the bristly blue couch and began to pace and shake. Bird said he'd had time to think about it. In spite of his commitment via email, he now didn't believe I had the proper training to enter a war zone. I argued with him, essentially making the point that every journalist in a war zone was at one time a journalist who had never entered a war zone. There has to be a first time. I was locked in a catch-22. I reiterated my conviction that Diet's story was a good one and that it was made for the Winchester Star, but there was no convincing Tom Bird. Something had changed his mind. Matt, I'm sorry, he said. He hung up. I continued to pace and shake. Joe wasn't home. It was just me and the animals and the computer, the sun going down, no cable TV, the world suddenly seeming so fucking cowardly and impenetrable, a fortress of fear. I felt baffled and thwarted. I felt frustrated. I felt like I'd done something wrong but couldn't name it. I felt like a loser. I was trying my best to get out of my room and into the world, into the center of events where I might be able to see something and therefore say something, maybe even do something of value. But it was hard to escape the room, that house we called the cabin. The world seemed to be conspiring to keep me locked up in that remote rural outpost. And as a writer who studied the lives of other writers, I knew there was a mixed message in this fear I was facing. One perspective suggested is the writer's job to stay in the room, to not yield to the geographical cure, the grasping and groping that comes from following the Hemingway and Kerouac spirit that intuitive sense that the story and the truth are out there. Be this as it may, I loved Hemingway and Kerouac and others like Jack London. I valued the fruits of their sacrifice. And as Hemingway once wrote, war is the best subject of all. War hath determined us, Milton writes in Paradise Lost, but I felt like war was determined to avoid me. I wanted to see the damn thing that was shaping everything else. I paced my way into the night, a feeling beginning to grow inside of me. I don't know if I began to fear my father's secret hand in these events that night, but I do remember my mind racing, my body thrashing around in bed. I tried to use booze and porn to kill the feeling, but it didn't work. Later that week, I sat in a dark classroom with my students and listened to a librarian talk to us about the importance of careful research. Caffeine was the only thing keeping me from a sense of despair during those daytime hours in which my engagement with my students was usually enough human interaction to prevent me from feeling utterly rudderless and isolated. 
But since it was that time of year when the librarians were charged with taking over a week of our introductory writing courses, I suddenly found myself without the sanctuary of those human moments, that precious conversation with students, sitting in that basement room of North Carolina A&T's Blueford Library, watching my students sleep in text while a kind but out of touch white librarian tried to engage them with jokes about movies from the 80s. I had no idea that I was experiencing boredom in the same quarters that the mastermind of 9-11 had experienced boredom two decades earlier. I tried to find a way out of the feeling, full of caffeine and frustration. I wondered if maybe I'd made a tremendous mistake by backing out on marriage and children, by banking on writing above all else, by seeing writing as this transcendent enterprise. I began to think of Karen and our old house and the dogs and all the good times we'd had, how maybe I'd been a coward to leave it all behind, and how maybe it still wasn't too late to go back. Maybe Thomas Wolfe was wrong. Maybe you can go home again. Maybe your father is right and is doing what he can to steer you back to the golden road before it's too late, Matt. Maybe you're lost. Maybe it is November and your despair over your mother's sickness and the love that you've lost has taken you to a pale rim of a placeless place where you've never been before. And maybe your father also feels this November feeling, but knows it better than you from the years of November he's known. Maybe you really would have gotten your head chopped off if you'd gone to Iraq. Maybe you truly are lost. Maybe it's not too late. These voices were growing stronger. And that day those voices won. I drove past our old house. No, I did not drive past, I stopped. Karen wasn't there and neither was the mysterious Jeep Cherokee. I let evil doer, that's a Jack Russell Terrier, lick my hand through the fence for good luck. I drove down Battleground Avenue to Gold's Gym where Karen and I used to work out. I didn't know what I was doing, but when I saw Karen's silver Prius, I knew I had to do something. I marched into the gym and the smell of sweat and metal, the sound of supplements grinding down in a blender. I saw the TVs and treadmills and spandex and free weights everywhere old music videos playing on the central screen banks, the evening news above the cardio machines against the far wall where I'd occasionally see Karen in my old Baltimore Orioles cap jogging away her stress, but she wasn't there. I felt frantic, like a cross between a maniac and one of those zany heroes from the romantic comedies of the 80s. Crocodile Dundee searching through the million faces of strangers in New York City so he can reconcile with his American lover and of course, the honest apology is always warmly welcomed in such movies and always eloquently delivered and backed up by boying notes from a booming soundtrack. The struggling couple left kissing in the center of the cheering masses as the credits roll. Redemption always there if you just have the courage to tell the truth and speak your heart like Crocodile Dundee. But what if you don't know the truth of your heart? Did I truly want to get back together with my ex? Or was I just lonely and desperate? My rejection by the Winchester star, the equivalent of a rebuff from a beautiful mistress, sending the reeling unfaithful husband back home to his hen-packing wife with a dozen red roses and a box of chocolates and a million promises for a fresh start and another baby. I passed by TVs showing scenes from the war, code orange all over Fox News. I pressed my face against the glass of the five o'clock aerobics class. And there among the reaching and kicking and jumping bodies was Karen. I watched her move, felt a hunger for her touch, her smile. She was wearing that Orioles hat, which seemed a good omen. She turned around at one point and I waved to her. She offered me a quizzical look in exchange. I made a trundling motion with my hand Felt like a mime, a man in prison, or some kind of awful hellish mute dream where you're locked away from the faces of your life. I wanted her to step outside the room after, but beneath all the lines I wanted to utter was a growing nervousness, a fear that I was just dealing with a feeling and not really dealing at all, yielding. That's all I was doing. I was just like a flag or a plastic bag, a piece of loose garbage blowing in the wind. And I half knew it. I wanted to seem like a man. So instead of owning up to the conflicted feeling, I put on a strong and certain voice and I tried to stick with it. But out in the parking lot in front of Gold's Gym with the logo of a muscle bound man looking down from the cheap plaster walls of that mini mall plaza, I began to cry. Karen came outside. 
We sat down in the parking lot under a paling sky of emerging stars and inland gulls, people getting their dinner from the drive through at the Wendy's behind us. When I said, I miss you, I meant it. That much was true. And when her eyes filled with tears, I knew she missed me too. Sometimes you can miss somebody so much that you create another person in their absence, a ghost, and thus you totally miss who they were by virtue of having replaced them with who you want them to be. I knew I was doing that even as I told her that everything was all my fault. Even as I was sitting there on a concrete parking block with my fists shaking at the sky begging for her to come back, I was remembering just how tense and awful the last year of our relationship had been. Her fist busting through the glass of our bedroom window, me always on drives late at night, sleeping in hotels just to breathe. After an hour of stuttering confessions and stillborn pleas, as it became clear to me that she wasn't going to take me back, I actually began to feel relieved. My apology had served some ejaculatory purpose. It had more to do with me than Karen. Maybe one of the toughest parts about being an American man is living in a country that worships strong and silent military men, superheroes, on the screen, and at the same time, learning to own up to just how complicated your emotions can be, acknowledging that you're sometimes more than just blowjobs, farts, and touchdowns, and sometimes less. The real man can speak of this, these moments of levity and failure, what's going on down below. The boy instead continues with his script of certitude, his love that is so strong that only a war can cure it. Sometimes I feel like I just want to die, I said to Karen. I'm thinking about going to Iraq. So, wow, I, that's never read that in public before. So I'm just going to hand it over to Colin here for a bit. We've still got a half hour and I'm just going to step back. All right. <laughs> Wow. I just got to like breathe for a second after that, Matt. That was, that was amazing. Um, and as you were reading, like poems of mine were pinging into my head. Um, so I guess I'll just jump right into those and, and, you know, draw, draw the connections where you will. Um, you know, in, in leading up to this, one of the things I was thinking about in addition to, you know, the different types of love is just how, you know, kind of my journey since war, um, has almost been a progression through those different types of love and, and me moving through types of love, the, the way that some people move through stages of grief. Um, so I'm going to kind of go in chronological order through my books, um, you know, which, which are a reflection of, you know, my, my progression from war to um, whatever stage in recovery and, in, you know, post-traumatic growth I'm in now. Um, but like I said, there's new stuff too, and so it's still coming. Uh, so here's a poem from shortly thereafter that's in Afghanistan. And kind of touches on that brotherly love. It's 3 a.m., or maybe 4, or 2, doesn't matter. The staggered breaths and stifled sobs are hourly tolls throughout these nights. You can't help but relive it. Can't help but see him, I'm sure. But I can't know for sure what it is you see or what it was you saw. For me, it was all just sound and blackness, the blackness that engulfed you, that raked Russian metal through your skin, singed the smile from your face. And now, back here in this cement cube we share, I rise to rock you back to sleep, hands and head engulfed in bandages as you had been engulfed in flames. And you, bear of a man, sobbing into my shoulder. This is actually the uh, the title poem of Shortly Thereafter, um, which occurs shortly after my return from war, hence the name. Shortly thereafter, I crash. It is not the burning rubber and twisted metal of a car careening into a guardrail, the wheel cut to avoid some common piece of turnpike trash. It is not the sound of the lamp hitting the floor, not from the table as I leapt out of bed. 
jolted awake by the dumpster hitting the ground. It is not the door, shut so hard it swings back open as she leaves. This isn't what we wanted, still ringing in my ears as the cat looks on inquisitively. It is the loss of the high of home, the sudden realization of nothing. Um, and now just a couple from uh, my second book, A Carry and Flux. Um, which, you know, like the title may suggest, uh, has a lot to do with, with the figure of Icarus um, and kind of me using my experience uh, to view the Icarus myth differently and, and using the Icarus myth as a way of viewing myself differently as well. Falling in love. I find it wholly foreign falling with someone there to catch me or at least collect feathers ripped out by wind or thrown up on impact, gather shards of wax, forged, melted, fallen, reformed, and wear a feather around her neck, not on her wings, reform the wax, add wick, not quill, and light it in my memory. Rainfall 2. Tears cannot be seen, for they too will fall. And down below, if someone crosses a street to get a coffee, or break a heart, or meet an old friend, or wait for something, anything, she will wonder why today's rain tastes like salt and loss. Matt, this is one of the ones that, that you reminded me of in your reading. So I'm going to, I'm going to read flying blind. Mm. I fly to see everyone at once. I walk and the back of every head is yours. I cannot help but strain my neck around to see, cannot help the hope or doubt or fear the face I'll see is yours. Everyone is you. You could be any. So I take wing and rise to see, to know that you are only one of millions. Back up that. Um, I see that Sherpa's on here, so I got to throw a, a couple haiku his way. Um, this is a, a pair of haiku that collectively are called the physics of us. Lesson one, things that fall. Rain, leaves in autumn, snow in winter, birds when young, me, the day we met. Lesson two, things that fall away. Cancer patient's hair, Old men's tired will to live. You, the day we met. All right. Going into some of the stuff in American etiquette here. This is the new one that, that came out. Um, you know, military relationships, it's, you know, it, Teresa was talking about it beautifully and, you know, the, the way things change, you know, uh, the way things, the way we change, the way people change and, and that, you know, things that sometimes bring us together um, aren't always enough to keep us together and, and, and sometimes are the very things that, that take us apart. Um, and this is a poem about that. It's called Honeymoon. War made much more sense when we were in it. When you had orders to give, when I had orders to execute. 
when both our tasks were known, even if their implications weren't. It was war that brought us together. Surely it will be war that draws us apart, the one we shared or the one we create. But for now, it is our common ground, our common cause for confusion in this civilian angle from which we now view it. Honeymoons are for happiness, but we took ours on the edge of war. We celebrate in sight of refugees and violent protests. Across the border, Syrians fight and die, both sides killed by U.S. weapons. But at least we enter marriage knowing who our kids will go to war with. Wow, snap, it's great. Beth, Thanks. Do I understand yes. that, that a question has come up, Beth? Yes, yeah. So, uh, Ali asks, so this says, this conversation has been about love and war. And for some of the readings, uh, it, it's been in, like in a regimented environment. Uh, this question is for Mary. In most circumstances, deployed relationships can, of course, be about lust, but they also exist within the power structure of the military hierarchy. Um, in this very regimented, regimented environment, do you think a black enlisted woman could find love when deployed? Uh, how does she navigate those minefields of, love, of, of war and the cultural issues at home? Great question. Um, yes, she can find love at war. <laughs> You can turn my camera back on. Um, I keep trying to turn it on, but it's not turning on. Um, How do we do try that? It, try it now, yeah. Try it again. There I am. Hey, welcome back to the world. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Allie, you and your questions. <laughs> um, I mean, I... Uh, when one falls in love or when there's lust involved, nobody's thinking about um, like issues of race, I don't think. I mean, um, I I've never let race uh, be, a, a, you know, something that gets in the way of what your heart does. Um, I know that I have, have been interested in people who have, who have allowed race to be um, an issue on their part, but I think I, I think it's it's almost easier for a black woman or a black man to um, to consider the idea of having an interracial relationship because we live around white people all the time, and um, you know white people are just part of our world. Um, I can't go about my life without having something to do with white people. So um, it's a whole different thing if you're white and you, you, know, you, can, you can navigate your entire life without interacting with black people if that's your choice. Um, so sometimes I think it's, it's different for people who say, and it's not even about them that much, it's more about what they think other people are going to think about them and that relationship that they have. And I think the same thing happens in, especially um, in, a, in a military situation, you know, um, there were many times when I could have, um, you know, engaged in some sort of sexual exploit or whatever, but you don't because of um, what someone else, what other people are going to think, you know, how it's going to appear, um, what, uh, you know, it's not so much about what, what my choices are, it's about, um, you know, what that choice is going to mean in terms of, of uh, you know, how other people are going to react. So I have no idea if that answered your question. <laughs> Can I, uh, can I bring up one final question before we maybe start to bring the evening to a close? 
or at least maybe hear from some other uh, folks out in the panel. Um, Beth, is there any, are there any other questions out there uh, from the panel right now? Uh, no, no, no. Go ahead, ask a, a question of the, of the panel. Well, I wanted, it just occurred to me that maybe for a second we could shine a light on exactly what we're doing here right now as one of the unique elements of the love stories from the Forever War. I mean, we are in a digital environment. This is not something that we saw in the first Gulf War. This is not something that our, uh, our parents and grandparents experienced in Vietnam or World War II. The digital is a kind of unique place where love letters are sent and all kinds of things have happened. How, does, how do digital environments shape relationships in the love stories that you've encountered or the poetry that you've encountered or just what you've experienced as veterans and soldiers? You know, I, I can uh, take a stab at that at first because um, in the Forever Wars, it coincided with email and being able to email home and then uh, even just a few years later, being able to video chat home. I remember calling home on, on an Iridium satellite phone, which is a communications officer, you know, I was privileged to have in the office all the time. That constant contact, both with people back home, but then even after homecoming, being able with, at a moment's notice, to get back in touch with people um, with whom you were deployed, even if you had decamped to different cities, um, or say we're serving with reservists who were stationed across the country. And those are the kinds of things that are so much more common now than they were decades ago where people had to write letters or, you know, a great uncle of mine actually met a woman on r, r in New Zealand during World War II. And the great family love story is he sent for her. And actually I have now a whole New Zealand, Australia wing of the family from that relationship um, and okay. from his marriage. But those stories are so much more rare. Like it's so much more often in those generations to have the one that got away. And now it's so much harder to be that one who got away or to lose somebody in that way if what you really want is to stay in touch with them. Um, so it takes intentional effort to break oneself of that love if one has fallen in love, say, in a war zone. Um, I think that's a chief difference. And, and I mean, if you talk to you know anybody who's young today too, right? Like, it's just different. You grow up on, on social media, like things are just out there all the time. Things can be documented at a moment's notice. Um, that is sort of the, the ephemera doesn't stay ephemeral necessarily. It, it's like perpetual. It's part of your permanent record, as Edward yeah. noted. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Mary, do you Colin, want to touch on the digital? Yeah, I mean, it's it's not something that's a huge part of my story because the technology wasn't totally there. Um, a and B. Um, my time in country was was such that we just we we didn't have access to computers and phones and and that sort of thing. Um, but it's definitely interesting to see, um, you know, as these wars go on, um, A, the way that social media is shaping people's perception of it, people who are now going to war, right? I mean, we've been in Afghanistan long enough now that there are people who weren't born when we went into Afghanistan that are now deploying there. And so for them, the role that technology and social media has played in their understanding leading up to their enlistment, um, you know, there's so much more information available to them than was available to us, I think. At the same time, there's so much more disinformation available to them. Um, and so I think you're starting to see that a lot more uh, play out. And in terms of the, the love side of it, um, you know, it's it's it blows my mind when, you know, we, uh, I watch a contemporary war movie and, you know, the guy's on the rooftop getting ready, you know, to go under siege and he pulls out his cell phone and, you know, is like FaceTiming with his wife back home. It's like, that's, that is so far from my experience of war. Um, you know, there were, with time differences and stuff, and if I had an internet connection, I might be able to get on AOL Instant Messenger. Um <laughs> And, and talk to my girlfriend back home. But for the most part, it was, um, you know, complete radio silence, um, which in some ways made it easier and, and in some ways made it harder, I think. I would just like to say that um, I love the cow painting too. 
I just really love the cow painting. Thanks. That's holy. Um, I was debating whether I should light up his halo, but he does have a little light up halo there. Fairy light. <laughs> holy cow. Holy cow. Holy cow. <laughs> Well, I just want to take a second to thank you guys all for being here uh, tonight. These, these folks out in the uh, in the audience, these are three wonderful writers. Uh, what I'm holding right here is Colin's most recent book, American Etiquette. Please support Teresa, support Mary, support me, support support, support all of us if you can. Um, support all of your uh, your veteran authors, all, all all your authors in your community, and. First and foremost, or last and foremost, I want to thank Beth Sheffield uh, for having us tonight. Beth, th thank you for creating a public space for this uh, event to happen uh, during this pandemic. This, uh, this has been really nice. And um, are there for, any for adapting it? Yeah, to this format. I, mean, I Matt, you mentioned this to me months ago. And yeah, I thought we were going to have like an actual North Carolina event. <laughs> I know there was so much to celebrate. We but wanted to get so great being able to bring in Mary and Teresa to to join us in this conversation. Yeah, yeah thank you guys so much. And yes, uh, all wonderful books. Uh, please uh, support your local authors, uh, your local independent bookstores, and also um, your public library. Remember. Uh, the Greensboro Public Library is, if you're in the Greensboro area, your library, and we sincerely believe that and love to hear from you and um, want you to uh, check out these authors' books that are in, in, our, in our library system and also, um, you know, read more about it. Um, their, their books touch on a lot of issues uh, that just will encourage more reading. So, you know, thank you guys for being here tonight, for making the library a cool space with amazing authors as yourself. I look forward to, um, you know, keeping up with your work. Um, it just was a very powerful reading and a great subject. And thank you so much, Matt, for, for um, connecting connecting us with uh, these writers. Um, uh, Mar uh, Martha Sebastian, the librarian at the Negro Free Library that now is the Vance Chavis Library, always said libraries are the root and fruit of the community. And I sincerely believe that. And thank you uh, for connecting us with us here tonight. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Beth. Yeah. Thank Bye, you. thanks for having us. Thanks everybody Bye. for coming. <laughs> Take care. Find everybody on Twitter. <laughs> yep. and, yes. Find us on Twitter. Twitter, if you have follow-up questions, uh, let us know. I, our Twitter handles posted anywhere. Let's post uh, them real we can quick put and I'll do a screen capture. Yeah. Everybody put them in the chat and I'll do a screen capture. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Trisha. Thank you. Thanks. Got it. Um, Mary, can you put yours in the chat? Or you I, I'm right? using my phone, so I don't really have a keyboard. Um, what's your my, Twitter handle? It's at ML Doyle author. Great. And we've all tagged each other in tweets so much in the last yes. week. So if you find one of us. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. I've Great. got all right. Thanks, there. everybody. Um, Bye. See you on Twitter. We'll see you later. Good night. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye.